A warm good morning to one and all. You are listening to Classics Audio. So today you will get a bird's eye view on William Shakespeare, his life and works. Along with tragedies, comedies, problem plays, Roman plays, sonnets and other poems, we have included major criticism of Shakespeare and a list of sources for his plays. At the end, you'll also be getting a list of the plays by Shakespeare in his chronological order and another list of works by him which you should need to really concentrate for your coming NTA UGC NET JRF examination. So, without wasting much time, let's get started. So, let's begin from the lifespan of Shakespeare. It spans between 1564 to 1660. As we all know, he is a famous dramatist actor, man of the theatre and poet. His birth is traditionally celebrated on 23 April which is also known to have been the date of his death. So for Shakespeare, April 23 serves both as his birth as well as death date. Then the standard and kind of education indicated by Shakespeare's writing such as he might have received at the local grammar school whose records for the period are lost. On 28 November 1582, a bond was issued permitting him to marry Annie Hathaway of Shortry, a village close to Stafford. She was 8 years her senior. A daughter, Susanna, was baptized on 26 May 1583 and twins Hamnet and Judith on 2 February 1585. We don't know how Shakespeare was employed in early manhood the best authenticated tradition is by John Orby. So according to John Orby, he had been or Shakespeare had been in his younger years a schoolmaster in the country. Nothing is known of his beginnings as a writer nor when or in what capacity he entered the theatre. Then Shakespeare became a leading member of the Lord Chamberlain's men theatre company soon after their refoundation in 1594. With them, he worked and grew prosperous for the rest of his career as they developed this Chamberlain's men developed into Lenton's leading company occupying the Globe Theatre from 1599 becoming the King's men on James first accession in 1603. So in 1603 the Stamberlines men theatre company was renamed as King's men and Shakespeare became a leading member in King's men. In March 1630 he and the actor or artist Richard Burbage received 44 shillings each for providing an imbarsa that is a titling shield for the Earl of Rutland at a court tournament. This is Shakespeare's last non-literary enterprise. In February 1660, his second daughter Judith married Thomas Cuny. He died according to the inscription on his monument on 23 April and was buried in Holy Trinity. His widow died in 1623 and his last surviving dissident Elizabeth Hall in 1670. Shakespeare's only writings for the press are the narrative poems Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucre published in 1593 and 1594 respectively, each one dedicated to Henry Rothsley, Earl of Southampton. Then the short poem The Phoenix and the Turtle published in 1601 in Robert Chester's collection Love's Martyr. Now let's consider the literary life and works of Shakespeare in detail. So here as we all know he is a repository of writings. So for convenience here we are categorizing Shakespeare's literary life and works. As far as the life of Shakespeare that is literary life of Shakespeare is concerned we can categorize into four periods, four phases rather. 
so this is not a formal categorization we are doing this for ease of study right so the first literary period falls broadly in between 1585 to 1594 okay in the first section of his literary life shakespeare wrote 26 sonnets so sonnets belongs to or sonnets belong to his early literary career and along with his 26 sonnets he also wrote seven plays okay so let's check the literary output of the period he wrote Henry VI, Part One, Part Two, Part Three, Richard III, Titus Adronicus, Comedy of Errors, Taming of the Shrew, and the poems Venus and Adonis and Rape of Lucre. So this is a literary outcome of his first phase of literary life. Now let's move to the second phase which falls in between 1594 to 1600. In this period, he has wrote chronicle history plays and comedies. The major works of this period includes plays such as Richard II, Henry IV Part 1 and 2, Henry V, and comedies such as Midsummer Night's Dream, The Merchant of Venus, much ado about nothing as you like it and twelfth night now let's proceed to the third phase of his literary life which falls in between 1601 to 1608 he mostly wrote tragedies or romances with tragic resonance in this period so this is the most important period in his literary life here he wrote hamlet or dello King Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra. He has also wrote some bitter comedies such as All's Well That Ends Well, Measure for Measure. Now let's come to the last period, the fourth phase of his literary life that is 1608 to 1630. So spans between 1608 to 1630. He wrote Winter's Tale the play, Chamberlain, the play, and The Tempest. Tempest is his last play. Then plays of this period are characterized by a grave cynicism and resignation. This period also includes works in collaboration that he wrote in collaboration with Beaumont of Fletcher and those works are Henry VIII and the two noble kinsmen. So these two works are written by Shakespeare in collaboration with Beaumont Fletcher. Now let's come to each category of works written by Shakespeare. Okay, let's start from comedy. So as far as the comical works of Shakespeare or the comedies of Shakespeare is concerned. So, in Shakespearean sense, a comedy is not a laughing stock, but a work that ends well and good. Okay. So, a work that ends well and good is what constitutes Shakespearean comedies. Okay. So, Shakespearean romantic comedies are all set in imaginative world far from the dull and dreary world of everyday life. So now let's have a list of the major comedies by Shakespeare. All's Well That Ends Well, The Comedy of Errors, Love's Labour's Lose, Merchant of Venice, Taming of the Shrew, Twelfth Night, Murray Wives of Winster, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, The Winter's Tale, as you like it, Cymbeline, Measure for Measure, Persilus, The Tempest. So, these are the major comedies written by Shakespeare. Now, let's come to major tragedies written by Shakespeare. Okay, so we have here we have to note that what is a tragedy? In Shakespearean sense, the tragedy ends with the death of the tragic hero. 
So who is a tragic hero? He is who undergoes suffering as a result of his tragic flow or error of judgment. In case of uh, Shakespeare's Othello, for example, tragedy occurs as a result of Othello's tragic flow, that is sexual jealousy. So, however, even though the hero dies, a moral order is eventually restored at the end of Shakespeare's tragedies. And these are developed out of earlier 16th century tragedies, which had roots in the tragedies of medieval poetry, verse accounts of disaster, suffering and death, usually of mighty rulers. Now let ha let's have a list of major Shakespearean tragedies. Let's begin from Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, King Lear, Hamlet, Othello, Titus, Adronicus, the tragedy of Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, Cymbeline, the life of Timon of Athens, the history of Troilus and Chrysite. So you can see some overlapping here that some plays are included both in comedies and tragedies. Okay, now let's come to Shakespeare's history plays. Okay, here Shakespeare's history plays usually have episodic plots unified primarily by the presentation of significant events from the reign of one monarch. So it concentrates the reign of a single monarch. They reflect the political ideology of the chronicle history books as well as the personal bias of the playwright. They may usually contain elements of both tragedy and comedy or exhibit the trace of just one of these genres. For instance, in addition to being history plays, Shakespeare's Richard II and Richard III are tragedies. Henry IV Part I and Henry V are comedies. So that, that is what I am saying, that you can send some overlappings. Then let's have a list of Shakespeare's major historical plays. King John, Richard II, Henry IV Part II, Henry VI Part One, Henry VI Part Three, then Henry VIII. Again, Edward III, Henry IV Part One, Henry V, Henry VI Part Two, and Richard III. Here, you should remember that Richard III is also considered as a tragedy. Now, let's get into Shakespeare's Roman plays. Though Julius Caesar, Antony, Cleopatra, and Coriolanus are included under tragedies as we have already mentioned they are also sometimes considered by critics in a separate category known as roman plays so why they are included in a separate category called roman plays all these plays are set in rome deal with similar subjects and make use of same souls so the source of all these plays constitutes Thomas North's translation of Plutarch's Lives. So for all Roman plays of Shakespeare, there is a single source called the translation of Plutarch's Lives by Thomas North. Now, what are the common characteristics of the Roman plays by Shakespeare? They are all set in ancient Rome as we have already said and were staged in Roman costume and Roman sets. Blood, violence are important feature of these plays. Suicide is depicted as an important Roman custom. Brutus and Cassius, Antony and Portia are all commit suicide. So Brutus and Cassius and Julius Caesar, Antony and Portia, all they commit suicide and Coriolanus also submits to death at the hands of Volscians. So Shakespeare depicts the Romans as self-conscious, theatrical and historically aware characters. So these are the Roman plays by Shakespeare, once again Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra. Coriolanus. 
Now let's get into another subcategory of Shakespeare's plays that is Problem Plays by Shakespeare. Okay, it was a critic, Frederick S. Bose, who first used the term Problem Plays for some of Shakespeare's plays in 1896. Though the term was not his coinage and was already in use before for writers like Ibsen and Shaw. So this, the word called problem play is not coined by Frederick S. Bose, but was used for the first time for Shakespearean plays by Frederick S. Bose. Now let's look into the details. Bose borrowed and adapted the term for Shakespearean use. So the three plays that are usually categorized as problem plays are All's well that ends well, measure for measure, toilers and chrysidae. So all these plays were written between 1599 and 1605. Then according to the critic Edward Doden, these three plays of Shakespeare marked a change from Shakespeare's previous comedy works. All well that ends well was grave and honest, measure for measure was dark and Bitter, while Troilus and Chrysidae was strange and difficult. However, Frederick S. Bose thought that his group of difficult plays or problem plays should also include Hamlet. Okay, so according to Frederick S. Bose, problem plays by Shakespeare includes Hamlet also. Along with all's well that ends well, measure for measure and Troilus Chrysidae, it includes Hamlet also. Now, he remarked that this play was distinguished from the others by its tragic ending, but it was akin to them in its general temper and atmosphere. Bose believed that these were plays presented problems of classification not just for the critics but also for the audience. They centered on problems which demands attention and broke the conventions of Chandra. Then there is no uniform consensus on Hamlet as a problem play while critics such as Bose and Tilliard argued that Hamlet was a problem play. Others like W. W. Lawrence and Peter Ure reject this argument. Okay, so according to Frederick S. Bose, Hamlet is also a problem play. Now let's come into the most interesting part where we are discussing Shakespeare's poems, which includes his, his sonnets. Right. So which are the major plays by, poems by Shakespeare? They include Venus and Adonis, Rape of Lucre, then his sonnets, poem called Passionate Pilgrim, Phoenix and the Turtle, Lovers Complaint. Now let's consider each of them in detail. Okay, so... The story of Venus and Adonis is taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis. So the source of the poem Venus and Adonis is Ovid's Metamorphosis. It describes the unsuccessful seduction of a handsome young man Adonis by Venus, the goddess of love. The poem contrasts a passive male sexuality with an active female one. Venus tries to woo Adonis, forces a sally of kisses upon him, Bows about her own charms yet fails to win him. In the end, Adonis is killed by a wild boar. His body melts away leaving behind a flower which Venus then wears in her bosom. Now let's come to the rape, rape of Lucre. It's derived from again Ovid's Fasti, Livy's History of Rome and perhaps Chaucer's The Legend of Good Woman. So Rape of Lucre has got three major sources, Fasti by Ovid, Livy's History of Rome and Chaucer's Legend of Good Woman. It describes the rape of a virtuous noble woman, Lucre, by the son of a king, Tarquin Sextus Tarquinus. Lucre is the wife of Tarquinus' friend. When Lucre's father and husband arrive, she tells them about the rape and asks for vengeance. After this, she stabs herself to death. At the end, the entire Tarquin family is rooted out, deposed and banished now let's come to the next poem 
Passionate Pilgrim. Passionate Pilgrim is a collection of poems by Shakespeare. However, only a few of these poems are today accepted as Shakespeare's. Phoenix and the Turtle is an allegorical poem in which birds die and become one in their love for each other. The Lover's Complaint, another poem, narrates the story of a young woman who laments over her seduction by a persuasive womanizing young man. He eventually leaves her and breaks her heart. Now let's move to the sonnets by Shakespeare. Shakespeare's sonnets are addressed to a person called Mr. W. H. This dedication has led to a series of speculations as to the identity of this person. The two leading candidates are Henry Rodesley, 3rd Earl of Southampton and William Herbert, 3rd Earl of Pembroke. So these two persons might be Mr. W.H. that Shakespeare is referring to in his sonnets. They are usually, the sonnets are usually divided into three parts. That is sonnet 1 to 126, the poet strikes up a relationship with a young man. So, poet's relationship with a young man is a theme of sonnets ranging from 1 to 126. Then, sonnets 127 to 154, which are concerned with the poet's relationship with a woman, variously referred to as the dark lady or as his mistress. Now, let's move into another important part of this session where we are discussing major sources of Shakespearean plays. So let's consider each play and its source. If you feel this information helpful in posting your preparation for UGC NET JRF exam then please subscribe this channel, hit on the bell icon near to it and also select the all option to get notified of the future updates.